Hey everybody, uh, back again for another Twin Peaks episode. This is episode 16 of season 2, and the title of the episode is The Condemned Woman. And if I'm assuming you've already watched the episode, so you pretty much know who that refers to. Alright, uh, let's get into it. Alright, we see an uh, owl figurine in a little glass case, then uh, a chessboard next to it. Um, and uh, we hear some more of what Wyndham Merle's um, tape recorder uh, recording playing. And uh, basically saying, hey Dale, it's uh, your move. Wyndham uh, warns Dale uh, to not allow his focus to waver from the board. Because he thinks that he he kind of wants, he wants to see, face Dale at his very best and beat him. Um, I think that gives him the most satisfaction. He doesn't want to Dale with his... Uh, his focus and his attention split a bunch of different ways. But little does he know that Pete is the one actually playing the game for him to uh, stall so he can get some more time to work on trying to track down Wyndham and uh, deal with some other stuff. Uh, yeah, so Pete's time to figure out the next move. So over at the Martells, we see that Pete and Andrew are get along like kind of like old schoolboys, and uh, Catherine is not happy about it at all. Uh, typical stick in the mud. Uh, Josie walks in, and sees Andrew, and uh, faints immediately. Um, I guess nobody told her or let her in on the fact that her scheme to get Andrew out of the way uh, was not accomplished. So she's having all sorts of uh, fun surprises. First Eckhart shows up, and now Andrew shows up. All right, uh, Harry's at the. Uh, Sheriff's Station, reading a newspaper article about the, the guy that Josie killed, or we are su assuming she killed. Um, Hank comes in, gets put in his place by Harry, basically, because he's trying to wheel and deal um, and give information. He's probably going to, I think, what his intentions were, or to uh, hand Josie over um, as a means of uh, getting... Uh, Everyone that was involved with the killing of, uh, or the uh, attempted murder of Andrew Packard, which, if Andrew Packard had showed up and Hank saw me, he would have, yeah, it, might, it would have probably fallen apart, because I guess, I imagine if Josie was on the hot seat, Andrew could have easily made an appearance and say, no, I'm I'm still alive. Uh, Harry says, you know, no deal, because he's uh, sick of Hank's BS. Uh, Hank basically... Mock, you know, mocks him a little bit and says, uh, well, I wonder what all your uh, constituents are going to think that uh, the woman that uh, conspired to kill Andrew is, is the one you're sleeping with. So, Harry didn't care for that too much. Uh, yep. Albert uh, basically confirms that the bullets that shot uh, the gentleman that, that uh, was taking Josie back to Hong Kong uh, match the ones that uh, were shot at Cooper. Josie's uh, the, sho the shooter beyond... Uh, a shadow of a doubt. All right. Uh, we're back at the Great Northern, and uh, Audrey, all of a sudden, I guess she's, uh, now that her dad's uh, back from uh, reenacting the Civil War, uh, once and has also, if we you do recall, has uh, had the mill and the Ghostwood Project um, all in his you know, greedy little palms, or greedy hands, and uh, Catherine uh, one-upped him and uh, came in uh, when uh, the murder case had yet to be solved about Laura Palmer, and Ben was an, a suspect, the main suspect, according to Harry, and then she ended up signing the, or she ended up getting Ben to sign Ghostwood and the mill back over to her, so now the, basically the only thing that uh, Ben has is the hotel. So now uh, Audrey is, I guess, uh, trying to muster the forces to uh, strike back for and to help her dad out. And uh, enter a John, Mr. John Justice Wheeler, a new face who is going to be part of an extremely boring side plot. So if you're, all I can say is if you are part of, if what draws you, <clears throat> excuse me, if what draws you to some of this stuff is Audrey's love life and Audrey's uh, romantic, uh, you know, interactions or, uh, you know, sexual tensions and everything with uh, 
other uh, male characters, then you might like this uh, particular subplot. Otherwise, it's 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 a character that in a sub in a side plot that could have been you know whittled down to the bare minimum, and it is basically filler as far as I'm concerned. I'll be brutally honest with you um, with that. So no, this unless I mean if you're a, not interested in the soap opera type stuff. There's there's a few comedic moments, but overall, it's that whole the side plot with uh, Ben, um, uh, this the new guy, um, and Audrey. Yeah, it's eh, blah <laughs> blah blah blah. So yeah, I'm not gonna give it any give it thumbs up. There's one. Let's just say it's one of the elements that made season two um, crappier than it should have been. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to say, uh, let's just say that Dale's place in Audrey's heart was a temporary residence, and now she's got found a new guy who's actually into her too, and yeah, and they get, and I'm going to spoil it, they get together. No, oh no, I hope the series isn't ruined for you, but it's pretty obvious that was going to be the case. Uh, yeah, some Ed and Nadine stuff that's really inconsequential. Nadine is, uh, finally hooking up with, uh... Mike, the uh, uh, friend of Bobby Briggs, who they don't seem to hang out anymore, so whatever. Uh, yeah, Dale uh, goes over to the Martells to confront Josie, and, and uh, basically she shows yet again that Josie only cares about herself. Uh, Catherine walks in after Dale leaves, pretending that she hadn't overheard what they've been saying. Kind of, uh, Josie's pretty much the rat that's uh, either caught in the trap or is about to get caught in the trap. Um, Eckhart doesn't know that Andrew is alive, uh, and so uh, he that uh, is kind of an, to her advantage because uh, she is, still assumes that you know she or she still assumes that now that Eckhart will believe that she was uh, part of the uh, conspiracy to get rid of get rid of Andrew in the, in the first place, and she. Gives her access to a firearm, and Josie gets this little smug smile on her face like everything's okay now, because she can just kill her way out of anything, so, yeah. She's an evil bitch, I'll say it, yeah. Josie's an evil bitch. Uh, yeah, and more scenes with John Justice Wheeler coming to help Ben Horn, who's now apparently a health nut and uh, wears track suits and is, has a good attitude now. Boring! Uh, Norma's sister Annie is coming to Twin Peaks. Uh, she, she does. She is becomes a important, more an important character in, the, and uh, you'll see that in future in the future few episodes we have left. And you also probably will recognize the actress if you were someone that you know grew you know grew up at least in the or was you know a teen or adolescent in the '90s and uh, or in the '80s um, you'd recognize the actress. And uh, we'll see who that is when, when she makes her appearance. Uh, she was at a convent, apparently. She's got a got her own backstory, um, so she's in kind of an interesting character. I'll just I'll just uh, drop that. And you'll have to wait and see for the rest. But yeah, she's not. She unlike John Justice Wheeler, her addition to the show isn't isn't a uh, a downer. Um, Shelly gets her portion of the Wyndham Earl letter that was torn up. It's uh, basically it's a poem, but. Uh, you know, obviously, without all three pieces, you can't read the whole thing. Ed comes in and sweeps Norma off her feet. So it's time for them to get married, I guess, and uh, start living the life they should have lived a long time ago. So good for them. Uh, Leo sits outside whittling uh, something. Wyndham comes out singing a song and dressed like a kind of like a trucker. One of his, uh, I guess, he's the master of disguise. And apparently Leo is whittling arrow shafts, uh, so what, somebody's going to be on the uh, receiving end of those uh, arrowheads. Not sure who it's going to be. Um, Norma confronts Hank at prison, because he's been locked behind bars and he's pretty much screwed. She uh, lets him know that it's over, no deals. Um, and yeah, so Hank uh, gets what is coming to him for all the crap he pulled. So good for Norma. Uh, she sounds like she's had a pretty miserable life outside of having a, you know, working a day in and day out at a diner. So, you know, it's good for her. She's going to finally see a sunnier skies for once. Uh, Pete set, joined uh, Herring Dale at uh, the sheriff's station. He's working on the stalemate game. 
Um, Harry still wonders, you know, whether even if uh, Pete is able to uh, keep pieces from being taken off the board for several moves or whatever. I don't know if they're, it's a move a day or whatever. Uh, Harry thinks that, you know, when it might just kill anyway, you know. But Dale doesn't believe uh, that he will do anything that isn't dictated by what's on the board. <laughs> But remember that um, Wyndham believes Dale is making uh, these moves and not in, uh, involving somebody else. It's a little bit better uh, chess. So needless to say, Pete Dale couldn't beat um, Wyndham, but maybe Pete could beat Wyndham in a game of chess. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I think Wyndham and Pete, their attitudes and, and their mindsets towards life and the world are, are polar opposites. Pete's a, you know, kind of a jokester type guy, a fun-loving, you know, kind of, you know, takes pleasure in the small things in life, and Wyndham's cold and calculating, so there there would definitely be an interesting uh, chess matchup between those two, based on, you know, their, their mentalities and their life philosophies, so. Um, yeah, let's see here, so, um, Albert, again, shows Dale... You know, proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that Josie's guilty. The powder remnants on the gloves, I guess, from the bullets fired. Um, someone has positively ID'd her at the airport. So Josie's, yeah, it's Josie. There is no doubt. Um, the next image is, is kind of an important one. Because uh, if you recall back to the pilot episode, that was basically the first image that we saw was Josie with her makeup on, you know, kind of look had looking at the mirror, admiring her 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 reflection and for a while and then looking over her shoulder as if someone was entering the room. So it's almost like we've come full circle with her at least uh as far as thematically goes, she's back to that. Um per, you know, and remember the, the circles that were mentioned by another uh, person in the uh, story as there's a golden circle. Um, and you'll, uh, know, if you re recall that, um, you'll know what I mean. And I'll, and I'll re mention it again at the very end of this, uh, given what happens to Josie. Um, yeah, so Andrew and Josie talk, remin you know, catch up on a little bit. Uh, Josie tries to BS him. Andrew lets her know that, you know, it's, it, you know, she's either going to have to go to Eckhart, make up, and uh, go back with him, or she's going to end up behind bars probably for the rest of her life, given she's uh, got a heck of a track record. She she might even be wanted by, uh, you know, foreign governments for stuff. So, yeah, she's uh, basically between a rock and a hard place, and I don't have any pity for her whatsoever. Uh, Donna meets James for a little picnic on a kind of a back road, logging road. Um, looks like James is basically, you know, has uh, been cleared of the whole deal with uh, Evelyn and her husband. She's going to testify against Mal uh, Mal the now deceased Malcolm to basically bl blame it all on him, you know, clear and say James had nothing to do with it. So James is in the clear. Uh, yeah, so, uh, James feels guilty about sleeping with Evelyn, but Donna doesn't, you know, fault him for it because of what was going on, and that James was basically carrying the weight of both Laura and Mandy's death on his shoulders, as if he'd failed them. So, yeah, he was a little bit screwed up, so she was at least uh, trying to be understanding about it. Donna, of course, wants James to come back to Twin Peaks with her, um, but James is basically, he needs to basically hit hit the open road for a while and, uh, you know, like he was doing before <laughs> Evelyn showed up and sidetracked him. Uh, and Donna says it's okay. Um, James wants her to come with him, you know, but she's, she just can't do that. Um, for whatever reason, she's still got her fam, her folks there and, you know, everybody there. So it probably wouldn't be uh, feasible. Uh, yeah. So I guess, you know, they had that whole thing where, uh, James said if they kept their hearts together long enough, you know, uh, they could get, they could get through some rough times. So I guess maybe that ended up being true you know, sentimental, fa sentimental and romantic in a way, but yeah, looks like I said, they managed to, uh, weather the storm as far as their relationship is concerned. So yeah, basically James is going to go hit the road and, um, have his own adventures or whatever out 
to wherever he's headed to, and uh, eventually, once he's uh, kind of gotten that wanderlust out of his system, and uh, his mind is clear, and his conscience is at ease, he'll come back to Twin Peaks, and the gal that's still wearing his ring. So, eh, that's nice, I guess. Sentimental, romantic. Uh, Harry comes looking for Josie at the Martells. Catherine says that Josie wants to go, went to go see a man named Thomas Eckhart. And I do believe that uh, Josie did mention um, Thomas when she was, uh, she had escaped from the, um, the, the guy that was taking her to the airport. So he's aware of who Thomas is and what kind of person he is. He's not a very nice man. Uh, Thomas uh, enters the elevator at uh, the Great Northern, and Andrew is there <laughs> to greet him. Uh, and, and initially, um, Thomas thinks he's seeing a ghost, but uh, ends realizing that, uh, no, this is Andrew in the flesh, and he can't fathom why and how this is happening. And so Andrew takes that opportunity and the advantage of his opponent to put the idea in uh, Eckhart's head that Josie b betrayed him and was in on foiling the plot to kill Andrew, which is, of course, a lie. Everything, that's all BS. You know, Josie was in, obviously, Josie, Josie wouldn't have fainted when she saw Andrew if she was actually um, on Andrew's side the whole time. She assumed he was dead. Um, so yeah, Tom, that's, he's basically just putting some of these thoughts in Thomas's head to, uh, get him enraged at Josie and get him, you know, probably wanting to, uh, reprimand her or who knows what, do what to her in, in, uh, revenge for this betrayal. Cause, uh, yeah, he, that's something he didn't expect and he doesn't have any proof otherwise to, you know, uh, disprove that she actually did, uh, uh betray him. So and Andrew does make a good point. He's, you know, paraphrasing. He kind of wonders if Josie manipulates men or does these things for some twisted pleasure she gets from it. And that wouldn't surprise me one bit, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Some more Audrey stuff. Skipping that. The three potential queens being the uh, queen piece on the chessboard. That being Aud Audrey, Donna, and uh, Shelly. Show up at the Great Northern Bar, um, put the three pieces of the poem together, read it, um, and Wyndham is sitting down further down at the bar in his trucker outfit, watching with total delight. So, what, Donna coming back is to, because she's one of the three that on that that uh, of those pictures that Wyndham chose. Uh, I guess that's the justification for her not kind of hitting the road with. Uh, James would not suit the plot. Uh, Dale is practicing fly fishing in his room. Um, I'm assuming he's going to go fishing with somebody. Probably Pete. Pete seems to be the one that loves fishing because we saw in a previous scene he's sitting there tying flies for uh, you know for fly fishing. So maybe that's the that's the plan. Dale is getting used to uh, rural life without much trouble. Um, he gets a phone call, and it is obviously Catherine Martell letting Josie know that, or letting Dale know that Josie is at Thomas Eckhart's suite in the Great Northern. Of course, Dale's still at the Great Northern. Uh, so yeah, he, uh, she tips him off. Um, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm sure Dale got the, uh, the skinny on who uh, Eckhart is, and obviously he knows that Josie's a cold-blooded killer. So he grabs his his sidearm um, and heads towards uh, the suite that uh, Thomas has rented. Comes to the door. He hears a either an argument or a struggle of some kind between uh, the two. A gunshot's fired and he breaks in. Uh, the two are laying next to each other in the bed. Uh, Eckhart gets up. He's been shot. Collapses. He's kind of laughing. I think he kindly. I think he finds the whole thing ironic and, and amusing in the same breath, you know, <laughs> he's got that look on his face like, oh, this is how I go out, being shot by Josie, you know, oh, isn't life funny? And it's kind of uh, the impression I got from him before he dies, and then of course she's takes the opportunity to pull that same gun and uh, have a standoff with Dale, um, basically lets him know, know in certain terms that she's not going to jail, no matter what. 
basically, uh, Josie tried to off Dale because she knew that the moment he came to town, that things were going to eventually end up in this position. I don't know if that's because he's FBI um, or what, because she was never connected um, directly to Laura Palmer and other than, I mean, in any way, as far as any wrongdoing, I mean, she basically was getting, you know, English lessons from Laura and that was it. So I guess maybe Josie figured that eventually with all that went on at the, with the, uh, the mill fire and everything that Dale would eventually, uh, you know, find out. But Dale was never really, I mean, that was just Harry's whole investigation, really. I mean, Dale was, uh, let's just say, you know, Josie, if Josie had just gone back to Hong Kong or whatever, she'd probably have been all right. But I don't know, in her mind, I guess she figured that, you know, getting rid of Dale would have, uh, kept, you know, Harry and the rest of them off any kind of track leading to her. So that's her, her, uh, rationale for, uh, sh trying to kill Dale. Harry shows up with his firearm drawn and yells at Josie to put the gun down. Um, Josie basically asks for his forgiveness and then, um, basically collapses almost like she had a heart attack or something, you know, you know, she kind of like went into shock or something and collapsed and just died immediately. And then we get kind of an interesting surprise that you probably were not expecting. Um, we get kind of a spotlight. Well, Harry and, and Joe is holding Josie in his arms and then that they fade out and a, there's like a spotlight on the bed and we see none other than Bob crawling up and over the bed, you know, looking as mad as a hatter and uh, asks kind of mockingly to Dale, you know, hey, Coop, uh, what happened to Josie? And he's laughing. So uh, and then we see the midget. In the red suit that we we saw at the Black Lodge, doing his his typical dance on the bed with a kind of a wicked smile on his face. So I th my guess is I think the Black Lodge just claimed a soul for it, and that's what I meant by the golden circle um, coming full circle, like the golden circle that uh, the one our man talked about, appetite and satisfaction. So. Josie was perhaps uh, not necessarily, I, I don't think she, she was ever taken over by an, uh, one of the inhabitants of the, uh, of the Black Lodge, but I think her wickedness and uh, the fear, remember fear, she was like, a, I mean, that's like I said, love and fear are, are important. So her fear at the very end, like, she, like being like a trapped animal. I mean, that was just if, if, uh, beings like Bob, um, you know, live off of that. I mean, she must have, you know, it must have been like a, you know, blood in the water, especially given if they travel through the, you know, how they travel or how they, if they go, to, you know, into our world through some kind of seam and a dimension or something. I don't know how that works, but given, you know, ever, you know, as the, uh, the net was closing in, you know, and she was getting back to, you know, and that cage was come, everything was kind of coming in to smother her, the amount of fear she must have been, uh, putting out <laughs> in, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we understand how it works in Twin Peaks. It's uh, it's almost like you know, like a like an energy or a, sub a sustenance for these these beings that live in the Black Lodge. So yeah, they must have been drawn to her, like um, like I said, like a shark that scented a you know a gallons and gallons of blood in the water. So I think that's the reason why that Bob and the uh, the, the midget, or which is basically the arm, the Black Lodge's ma manifestation of the uh, missing arm from uh, Philip Gerard. Uh, yeah, that's why they were there, uh, just soaking it all in. And that uh, was pretty cool, actually. I, I like that touch that they put on that scene. Um, though, right after, I don't really know how I feel about it, because the whole Josie's um, face um, showing up on the drawer handle... You know, as she's kind of looks like she's in agony. She's kind of you know, like like that's supposed to be her soul or or something. And then all of a sudden, the uh, the drawer handle 
starts to distort outward like it's her face and she's, you know, scream, you know, screaming or moaning or whatever. And then it ends up permanently, you know, in, depicting kind of a mockery of her, of her screaming face. Um, I don't know. I don't, I would assume that that is not something that actually happened. Like some, you know, like the housekeeping comes in, in the next day and they see that one of the drawer handles distorted in the, in the, you know, in an agonized human face. So, I mean, it, they, I, I think it was done for effect, but I'm pretty much going to dismiss it as actually being other than kind of a, you know, kind of a, they wanted to do a special effect type thing to, to end the episode to kind of give a, a greater impression of what happened to Josie's uh, soul after, after it, her physical body died. So yeah, I don't uh, want to, I don't want to try to th think too much more into that because it just kind of screws with the lore and everything. And it just opens up a whole bunch of questions that I think they're just trying to look kind of be something, you know, cause this is like 1991. So, I mean, that kind of, uh, you know, special effect type of thing, it was, uh, probably not cheap. Surprisingly now you could probably, someone could do it on, you know, a cheap I don't know, software program that costs, you know, 40, 50 bucks with, you know, in a, in a half hour back then it probably cost a lot of money. But anyway, so yeah, that's, uh, how the episode ends and bye bye Josie. Um, now and Harry gets to deal with the aftermath, and everybody that knows Harry gets to deal with the aftermath of him realizing, uh, you know, that his uh, his lover and his uh, the woman of his dreams is now, you know, adios. Uh, yeah, so pretty good episode. Um, got some tied up some loose ends there on some of the stories. I introduced some characters I really could care less about. That's like John Justice Wheeler, but I'm not going to harp on that too much. But anyway, once we now that we've got that, and it's that's been kind of a major side story. It's made probably the whole um, Mill, Josie, Catherine, Ben, and all that is kind of a, the the mainstay as far as the si a side story goes through most of it. So it's uh, it's met its final conclusion, and it wasn't disappointing. But yeah, uh, that's it for this episode, folks. Uh, I'll be back with another one for episode seventeen. And we're getting close to the end, so let's uh, see what we've got coming up. I'll talk to you next time in the next episode. Until then, take... Until then...